Uno, dos, tres, part three for Manuel Esperanza Baños. Hay mucha diferencia en el gasto eléctrico entre usted y una persona no conectada. So in English, um, how much difference between you and a non-connected person on the electric bill? So my electric bill is pretty high, but it's actually not as bad as some large families because I just it's just me and my fiance Fernando. So um, our electric bill is anywhere between two fifty and three hundred dollars a month. Um, most of that comes from just all the computers and, and backup and all the charging of all the devices in the house. A lot of it has to do with just the sheer number of connected things in my home. Uh, every single light bulb in my house is smart. All the speakers in my house are smart. Each one can be controlled. Every single light and every single speaker in my house can have a different color and different sound if I want it. Uh, and that takes a lot of electricity. I don't think it's as bad as some people would assume. People, some people would say, hey, that's huge. Um, but even with my electric car, my, my bill only went up about 20 or 30 dollars a month. Um, and with clean energy, electricity can be a lot better. So maybe one day it'll all run on sun. I don't know. So with that, hopefully that answers your question about electricity. And we'll go to number nine. ¿Tienes ansiedad si alguno de tus aparatos se queda sin electricidad y no puede conectarse a la red? And in English, in inglés, uh, have you got anxiety when any of your gadgets switch off and can't be connected to a network? Well, there are two types of anxiety. There's uh, battery anxiety and connected anxiety. Uh, life is better with data connection than battery. So I'd rather actually have connected data than battery. Uh, you can get more battery, you can't get more connection. So uh, do I get anxious? Eh, I get annoyed, uh, but I won't say I get anxious. A los jóvenes nos critican por estar conectados. ¿Cómo podemos defendernos de esas actuaciones? Young people are criticized for being connected. How can we defend ourselves from that critique? Um, well, what you're describing is something called digital dualism. And that means that both young people and old people, because I see young people criticize young people uh, for being connected, um, believe that there is something superior about being offline than online. And I think that's where young people need to learn to drive the message and the critique too. There, is, there isn't a superior experience in one place or another. Right? Life isn't better if you're completely connected all the time. Life isn't better if you're completely disconnected all the time. Where life is difficult is when we judge one over the other. Um, so, you know, for older people who, for younger people speaking to older people who might say to them, you know, hey, you're always on your phone or you're always on the internet, you know, older people were always in their cars, they were always at their jobs, they were always talking to other people, you know, for that matter, you know, people who were over 40, you know, they were, you know, if they can be criticized, they should be criticized for needing other people. I mean, if you go back 100 years, most of what people did was solitary. Um, we, we really relied on the land and nature and a lot of other things. Um, you know, and then we had a whole generation who was addicted to TV, my generation. We were, we were accused of being TV addicted. And then people slightly 10 years younger than me were addicted to being video games. So every generation is accused of being addicted to something. Uh, my mother's generation was accused of being addicted to the telephone and actually with a cord. So I think young people, when confronted by old people, need to maybe address them and ask them this question. Like, what makes you believe that my life online is somehow diminishing my life with you? Uh, because there is no online or offline. Everybody's connected all the time. Uh, and if someone says that you're not paying attention to them, they might have the attention problem, not you. So with that, we will go to the next question. Hopefully that's not as sensitive. ¿Podría explicarnos un poco más acerca de los gadgets y otras herminetas que poses? So this one I'm not sure about. Um, this one is number 12. Uh, could you explain about the gadgets? Okay, because I don't know the chalk. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I can't answer the question 11 because it says something about chalk. I don't know what that means, but. 12 is, could you explain a bit about your gadgets and the other electronic machines that you can use? So there are two types of systems that I use, systems that are on the body and systems that are in the house. Um, there are other external systems when you get in the cars and you know things outside like weather uh, that are not on me or around me, but actually I link to that data. 
Systems that are on me usually fall into several different areas too. There is the perceptible and the imperceptible. So the things that you can see on me, like our, our wrist or um, band, uh, or maybe like a Google Glass are obvious and perceptible. Um, the things that you can't see if you were to wear a posture belt or a chest strap, um, those things usually collect more invasive data and the feedback loops are a little bit more intense. Um, as far as uh, wearables also, there's another layer that you can segment. So things that are above the neck and wearable and things and visible and things that are below the neck and wearable. The things that are above the neck are usually feedback loops that involve vision or sound, obviously, because that's where your ears and eyes are. And things that are below the neck are usually things that involve body monitoring, such as heart rate, pulse, I'm sorry, um, heart rate, blood oxygen, etc. Um, and then you've got a third set of systems uh, that relate to the body that you really can't say that are actually ephemeral or temporary, and those would be things that withdraw blood or take samples, such as urine. Uh, externally, you've got things like the Internet of Things, which actually are feedback loops that either create data, collect data, or sense data uh, within a room. So a room that has a light sensor or a light in a room, they could be connected to each other. Uh, hopefully that answers a little bit of that question. It's a very, very huge topic when you think about the quantified self, the body versus the home, the Internet of Things. And we will move to question 13. ¿Cómo has conseguido tantos aparatos diferentes y tan poco comunes? Uh, how have you got a lot of uncommon, uh, how have, how have you got a lot of uncommon and different gadgets? Like, how did you get them? How did I get them? Oh, how did I get them? Um, so, so sometimes people send them to me, and, but I don't like to use those because then I feel like I'm obligated to talk nice about people, which Fernando will tell you I don't like to talk nice unless I want to. And then... Um, but most of the things I research or I see at conferences or I'll just get really interested in, I just, the science behind things is really interesting to me. But more than anything, I'd love to see how people market products to other people. So Fitbit and Apple Watch are marketed pretty simple. But if you take something like the Spire, which is a, uh, a wearable that you wear under your belt that captures your respiration, that's actually marketed now as almost a mindful device, so a device to help you understand how stressful you are. But it didn't used to be. It used to be an activity tracker. So I'm really just interested in that. Most of the gadgets I find at Apple, the Apple Store, uh, but often more many of the cool gadgets I find at conferences where they just sell them right there, like on the side of the on the side of the conference for anybody walking by. So we are going to answer our last three questions after this last segment. Be right back. <laughs> 